The coalition has denied conducting secret talks with distant Republicans following an escalation in potentially lethal terrorist attacks in Northern Ireland. Today, Sinn Féin's Martin McGuinness told the BBC that discussions were going on between the governments in Ireland and Britain and the breakaway groups. Well, earlier this week, Owen Paterson, the Northern Ireland Secretary, said there were no talks were being sought through intermediaries. So what's going on? In a moment, we'll debate that with Patrick Mercer and Dolores Kelly of the SDLP. But first, there's a report from Liz McKean. His code name was the Mountain Climber, the go-between who crossed a troubled divide, allowing the British government to talk to the men in balaclavas in secrecy. Now, as Northern Ireland faces what its chief constable is calling the gravest threat in more than a decade, we're told history is repeating itself. Martin McGuinness, who in his balaclava days was himself involved in secret talks with the British, says there's no doubt. And I do understand the governments will come out and say, you know, that this isn't true, it isn't happening, and they have all sorts of mechanisms and phrases to use which cover themselves. But, but the reality is that uh, some of these dissident groups, I know for a fact, have been involved in discussions with both the Irish and the British government in recent times. The Irish and the British government may well deny that. That doesn't concern me in the least. I know what's happening. And deny it they do. Sinn Féin, now the party of peaceful Irish republicanism, has itself offered to hold talks with a group linked to the dissidents. The 32 counties sovereignty movement says no talks are imminent. When I met one of the leaders last year, he defended the armed resistance to British rule. Is it legitimate to target police officers? It would be perfectly legitimate to, to, uh, to target anyone who is uh, promoting British rule in Ireland. The targeting is remorseless. 48 bombing incidents already this year, including undercar booby traps, mortar, pipe and blast devices. 32 shootings, all linked to dissidents, and 27 police officers forced to move home. The dissidents have been regrouping and um, they have also been recruiting. They have recruited former provisional IRA members that would have expertise in bomb making, for example, in, in, in um, manufacturing and, and, and planting undercar devices that we have seen in recent attacks. Um, and also just a greater disillusionment with the peace process in working class nationalist areas. In the course of the last 18 months, there's been a shift in the targeting of police officers from where they work to where they live, also placing their families at risk. Traditionally, the Protestant police lived in what were considered safe areas, but the growing numbers of Catholic officers often live where they grew up. And it's clear from the spread of recent attacks that no officer can feel entirely safe. This month alone, a car bomb detonated outside the main police station in Derry. There was also a series of undercar booby traps. A senior army officer was targeted at Bangor, a Catholic woman police officer at Kilkeel, and a civilian police worker in Cookstown. The extent of the terrorist activity has become geographically very widespread and that's a very worrying situation for the police service of Northern Ireland and whilst we've had some success in arresting people for some of these offences and some of them have been charged, nevertheless it's extremely worrying that these so-called groups have now consolidated their position and have amalgamated. In Northern Ireland it's said that good luck alone has spared police and public serious injury. The dissidents have experienced technical mishaps, but their intent is deadly. What we are seeing is a thorough level of planning. For example, the, the car bomb attacks. We're seeing um, wreckage taking place. We're seeing hoax devices being in place before um, the actual attack itself. And those hoax devices um, are specifically deployed to time the responses of the emergency services, the police forces, the bomb disposal teams that respond to them. They then watch those, they're called dickers, they um, carry out a thorough assessment of the emergency services procedures and then they'll make a note of everything they've seen and done and they'll tweak the actual uh, final attack before they then deploy the car bomb, for example. And what about the resources to deal with this threat? The rioting in Belfast this summer showed the challenge they're facing, but with police numbers cut and no troops to call on, there are calls for an urgent reassessment. We're just about coping as it is now. Are you just talking this up to try to boost your campaign for more resources? 
Well, I don't think I need to boost this up because the evidence is there and speaks for itself. If you look at the escalating uh, number of incidents that there have been in the last eight months, for example, and compare it to what happened last year and the year before, you can see there's a very steep uh, incline in the number of incidents that have been occurring, and that is very worrying. At the very least, Sinn Féin wants to reach out to the working-class nationalist areas where it's been losing influence. A few years ago, you wouldn't have scenes like um, young people telling the likes of Bobby's story, um, a senior Sinn Féin member and, and provisional IRA member, to clear off. Um, Sinn Féin would have been able to stop the rioting. They would have been able to stop trouble. There is a strong challenge from the dissidents to Sinn Féin in working class Republican areas. And I think despite what the party says in public, that is of great concern. And that would explain why, for instance, Sinn Féin might be up for talking to the dissidents. I think that Sinn Féin are, are under pressure um, from, from their own supporters as well to talk to the dissidents. And I think what Sinn Féin and the IRA hoped for was, was what the, when the IRA called their ceasefire, that that would be an end to Republican violence. The Northern Ireland peace process was founded on secret talks and many believe the recent upsurge in violence will be ended by the same means. Certainly politicians need to show that violence doesn't work. Talking is their only logical step. Liz McKean there will join me here as the Conservative MP Patrick Mercer who was a Shadow Security Minister and from Belfast Dolores Kelly of the SDLP. Thank you both uh, very much indeed for joining me. Uh, Patrick Mercer, Martin McGuinness said he knows it. He said, I know it's happening. H how does he know it? Do you think he knows it? Well, um, Emily, I think, I think we've got to be careful about exactly what we hear here and what we believe. There's a grave difference between official government talks. They may be covert but actually government talks which are sanctioned at the highest level between ministers, um, um, civil servants or whatever, and, and intelligence officers whose very job it is to talk all the time to dissident elements, former dissidents, well, etc. I, I, ass now, I, mean, I, I assume you know, you're, you're trying to explain why Owen Paston, your Northern Ireland secretary, would have denied that they were in any kind of talks just three, four days ago. But, but I mean, let, let's be clear about this. Um, the British experience of counterinsurgency from... Wolf Tone's time in 1798, if you like, particularly in Northern Ireland or in Ireland as it used to be, has always involved understanding what our enemies, those who would, who would ruin whatever peace process we're talking about, exactly what they intend to do. Now, that is a normal, perfectly normal process of intelligence gathering. There's a difference between understanding, gathering. though, isn't there, and... Presumably, talks are about negotiation of, of some kind. Of, of course, but, but it's naive to suppose that anything else is going on. Dolores Kelly, isn't that right, that there have always been covert talks, and as Liz McKean explained or you know, uh, said, that that was basically what led to the Good Friday Agreement? Absolutely. Uh, John Hume uh, was very much responsible for leading uh, Sinn Féin in from the cold, and the SDLP has always uh, promoted uh, the idea of dialogue as in, in any uh, conflict management uh, process. That, that is the way to go. And certainly the experience over the last 40 years has been that there has been dialogue uh, between the different uh, combatants uh, within any conflict, so particularly what do, here in the North. What do you make of the kind of the why now question then? I mean, uh, there was that possible theory that Sinn Féin is actually testing the water here, that it's under pressure from its own supporters and it has to go that way. Uh, well, I think that's true. Uh, there is a, an onus on politicians to try to build the peace, and certainly the community demand it. Uh, there are, I think, a number of people who were former Republican prisoners feel very, very much uh, d disenfranchised and certainly very dissatisfied uh, in terms of their lot in it all. Uh, they see uh, former uh, IRA members uh, winding down across the world stage, but for many of them, uh, their lot in life hasn't improved, and they served many of their young and years of their prime in prisons and, and for what. Uh, I also uh, think uh, that uh, Sinn Féin are under pressure uh, from uh, many within the wider nationalist community and also uh, the, the, what we've seen in terms of the rise of violence over the last few weeks is uh, methods that were used uh, by the IRA sure. in the past. 
uh, being adopted by current uh, terrorist organisations, and that I, doesn't I mean, compare if, favourably if that for is Sinn Féin. Sure, I was just going to bring Patrick Mercer, uh, forgive me, if, th if that is what is at stake here, why do they even pretend they're not happening? Why all this talk of, of you know, covert, if oh, you like, when everyone is accepting that it has to go on? Well, Emily, because I don't think we're at the stage yet of, of the, the evolution, if you like, of that, that, that strange period of violence that we saw from 1969 to about 1994. That's an aberration in Irish history. It is. Um, th these pulses of activity happen roughly every 20 years. They're, they're, they're brought to an end, with the possible exception mm. of the last set of troubles, by, by a combination of social, military and political pressures. This is nothing unusual. This but, is a perfectly normal series of conversations between intelligence officers and their opponents. But, but the elephant in the room, if you like, is what they are being offered. We don't know what they're being offered yet because we're not clear, as far as I can see, exactly what the threat is. The different thing, the different, the different aspect of this from the last set of troubles, for, for, the, for the want of, want of a better phrase, is that now we have the likes of Sinn Féin, the, the, the respectable leftover elements, the now respectable leftover elements of the old provisional IRA campaign, also being used as a lever against the dissidents. Yeah. Very hard to call what's uh, going to happen uh, there. Uh, Dolores, can I, can, yeah. Yeah, I just want to ask you one, one point, because we understand, or we think we know, that the last government talked to the real IRA even in the weeks that led up to, to the OMA bombing. I mean, that surely proves the futility of it, doesn't it? Well, what we saw was the British government talking to the leaders of the IRA in the early 70s and we didn't get the full ceasefires into 94, 98. But really what is different from uh, the last 40 years is the whole context. We have the Good Friday Agreement, we have the endorsement of the people of Ireland, both north and south, overwhelmingly for uh, how to resolve our difficulties in terms of the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement and also uh, the reform of policing and uh, human rights being in enshrined right across the north. So, you know, we're talking an entirely different context uh, nowadays and uh, we have uh, that widespread support throughout the community for the Good Friday Agreement. And, and do, you, do you buy the argument that it is not, uh, if you like, fractioned splinter groups now, there is a sort of coherence to the real IRA and the, the, the dissident groups we're talking about coming together. Well, there's certainly been a huge upsurge in violence and the type of uh, attacks right across the north in recent weeks, which would uh, make many people feel and believe that their former uh, provost moving across to the distant groups now, given their uh, recent attempts at car bombs, for example. Patrick Mercer, you're shaking your head well, very no, briefly. I, mean, I think Dolores makes some very good points, but the whole point is this. There is no coherence, whether we're talking about the continuity IRA, the real IRA, or, or, or factions that don't even necessarily have names. At least when you were dealing with the provisionals or the Irish National Liberation Army, there was a form of coherence. All of that is now shattered. Okay. Thank you both very Thank much you. indeed. Thank you.